This is the Biomolecules 3 lecture that should have been delivered as part of the Foundation Phase Module 1.1 in Week 2, Structure and Function of RNA. Today we'll cover the intended learning outcomes, the central dogma of molecular biology, the basics of RNA chemistry, the structure and function of mRNA, the control of transcription, structure and function of rRNA, tRNA, and the function of RNA in protein synthesis. The structure and function of other RNAs will be covered in the SDLA. The intended learning outcomes for this lecture are that students will be able to identify the attributes of nucleic acids that enable them to function as templates and or as machines. They will be able to describe the structure of prokaryotic and eukaryotic promoter regions. They will be able to identify different types of RNA and their associated functions. And they will be able to describe the process of protein translation. As I've mentioned in the DNA lecture last week, the central dogma of molecular biology is set out as follows. The template DNA is capable of its own replication, this loop here, or of being transcribed to, RR, to RNA. The RNA molecule can then be translated to protein, and the protein can carry out functions within the cell. Today we'll be looking at the processes of transcription and translation. So first of all, the basics, the functions of RNA and the chemistry of RNA. So there are three major types of RNA in the cell, and these are required for the process of liberating information from the DNA in the nucleus and taking it into the cytoplasm where it can be used to construct proteins. The three major types of RNA involved in this process are mRNA, which is the coding message that travels out of the nucleus, rRNA, which is a non-coding structural RNA that forms part of the ribosome, and tRNA, a non-coding RNA that's involved in codon translation. RNA differs from DNA in one very subtle group change. So this is the base, this is the sugar, and this is the phosphate moiety of the RNA nucleotide. And the difference is on the two prime carbon of the sugar, there is a hydroxyl group instead of a hydrogen. So in DNA you would have a hydrogen here, in RNA you have an OH. You can see that the numbering convention for the sugars in RNA are the same as that in DNA. So you have the oxygen molecule at the top, you've got your one prime carbon with a base attached, the two prime carbon in RNA with an OH attached, the three prime carbon with the OH that's required for condensation of the next nucleotide, the four prime carbon, five prime carbon, which is not part of the ring structure and has the phosphate moiety attached. Now I'd like to cover the structure and function of mRNA. So I want to talk about promoter organization, basic transcription, the differences in between pro prokaryotes and eukaryotes, how mRNA is capped and tailed, and splicing. So looking at promoter regions first of all, prokaryotes and eukaryotes have broadly similar promoter structure, however the distances involved differ. So at the top of the slide here we have the, a classical prokaryotic promoter site. The start of RNA transcription is always defined as plus one and you have control elements upstream of that plus one start site. So anything to the left hand side when it's shown like this is considered to be upstream of plus one and anything to the right hand side of plus one is considered to be downstream. And in this case RNA transcription moves from the left hand side of the screen to the right hand side. So in prokaryotes at approximately 10 bases before the plus one start site, we have something known as the Pribnal box, and at minus 35 bases, we have the minus 35 region. These two control elements assist in the promotion of RNA transcription. 
In the eukaryotic promoter site, you can see that there are broadly analogous regions. So here we have the plus one start of RNA transcription. And at minus 25, we have a Tata box. And you can see that the Tata box only differs from the Privno box in its final nucleotide sequence. So these are quite specific nucleotide sequences in these boxes. And then at minus 75, we have the CAT box, which is not always present, but often. Moving on, you can see how these elements function in the assembly of the transcription machinery. So this is the gene control region for gene X. Shown in white here is the actual gene that will be transcribed. So this interface between the yellow region and the white region is plus one. So this is the area that will actually form an RNA transcript. You have the gap here. So this is about 25 nucleotides because this is a eukaryotic promoter we're looking at. And here's the Tata box. And general transcription factors assemble on this Tata box. Once the general transcription factors have assembled, they can recruit RNA polymerase 2 and other factors required for its function. And this machine that's now assembled is capable of transcribing the DNA template into the RNA transcript. There are other control regions, regulatory sequences spaced upstream and downstream of the gene. And proteins that assemble on these regions are also capable of interacting with the polymerase and either upregulating or downregulating the activity of the gene. Collision of the polymerase itself with DNA is random and the interaction is very weak. So it's the interaction with these other transcription factors that stabilize the interaction between the polymerase and the DNA and promote activity of the gene. Once you have this transcription machinery assembled at the promoter, the following is an overview of how the actual RNA synthesis occurs. A bubble is melted in the template DNA region into which the polymerase is able to insert itself. And this copies one of the DNA strands and synthesizes a complementary RNA chain. As the RNA chain elongates, it's displaced from the double helix and the double helix reforms. Once the transcription machinery has finished transcribing the gene, the full RNA strand will be displaced from the DNA and the DNA double helix will reform. So now I'd like to consider some crucial differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. There are quite significant differences in transcription and translation because in prokaryotes there are no internal membranes, no internal structures, so there's no physical separation of the processes of transcription and translation. In eukaryotes where there are multiple different types of organelles and there are many internal structures and membranes, Transcription and translation are physically separated. Transcription occurs in the nucleus, where the DNA is located. The mRNA is then exported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, where translation occurs, where the ribosomes can be found. Eukaryotic mRNAs are referred to as monocystronic, so one mRNA molecule gives rise to one single protein, or polypeptide chain. Prokaryotic mRNAs are referred to as polycystronic, and that means that one single mRNA molecule can give rise to several proteins or polypeptide chains. Another significant difference between the two is that eukaryotic mRNAs are subjected to splicing and undergo other covalent modifications before they're used for translation. And this is possible because of the physical separation of transcription and translation. This is not possible in prokaryotic transcription translation. So just to illustrate what I was saying about prokaryotic and eukaryotic mRNAs, at the top here we have a prokaryotic mRNA that is polycystronic. So we have five prime end, of the RNA molecule, the three prime end of the RNA molecule, and we have three coding sequences on this molecule. So when ribosomes bind and translate this into protein, 
This section here will give rise to protein A. There's a second ribosome binding site, and when translated, this will give rise to protein B. And a third ribosome binding site, and this coding sequence here will give rise to protein C. So three separate proteins or polypeptide chains from a single mRNA molecule. And this is what we call a polycystronic mRNA. At the bottom of the slide here, we have a eukaryotic mRNA. So again, we have the 5' end of the molecule and the 3' end of the molecule. And this time you can see that there are covalent modifications that have occurred. So we have a 5' cap at the 5' end, and we have a poly A tail at the 3' end of the molecule. We have a ribosome binding site, and this time there's only a single coding sequence that gives rise to one protein or polypeptide chain. And this is what's known as a monocystronic mRNA. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, eukaryotic mRNAs are covalently modified with 5' caps and 3' tails. The 5' cap is a 7-methylguanosine nucleotide that's added to the 5' end of the mRNA chain with a 5' prime to 5' prime triphosphate bridge. Now this is unusual in that normally you get a 5' prime to a 3' prime linkage happening in both DNA and RNA. But this 5' prime to 5' prime linkage is much harder to break. So this protects the 5' prime end of the molecule from nucleophilic attack. It means that nothing in the cell can easily come along and break this off. The 5' prime cap also aids ribosome binding to the mRNA and aids export of the mRNA from the nucleus. At the other end of the RNA molecule is a 3' prime poly A tail. So here in green we have the template DNA shown with the RNA polymerase shown over the transcription bubble and the RNA molecule coming out from this bubble in red and you see it's being displaced from the helix. As the nascent RNA molecule grows, the RNA polymerase will pass and transcribe what's known as the cleavage signal, shown here, AAU AAA. Once the RNA polymerase has passed this cleavage signal, the RNA is cut here by a specific endonuclease, and poly A polymerase picks up this cut end and adds a poly A tail. This can involve the addition of as many as between 100 and 300 AMP residues. This is also protective to the mRNA because it means that a large number of nucleotides have to be attacked and removed from the molecule before the actual coding sequence is in danger of being shortened. Finally, I mentioned that eukaryotic mRNAs are subject to splicing. Eukaryotic nascent RNA molecules contain both introns and exons. So this is a pre-mRNA molecule shown at the top here. And we have exons, which are the coding region, and introns, which are non-coding regions located between coding regions. These introns have to be removed before the mRNA can function as a template for protein production. Introns can be self-splicing or can require the assistance of the spliceosome. But either way, you have a lariat structure that forms within the intron and then the, the two ends of the adjacent exons can attach to one another to form a continuous coding region. It's very important that this splicing procedure is very precise. If a single nucleotide is left behind or a single extra nucleotide is removed at the splice site, the whole coding sense of the subsequent exon is shifted and will be nonsense. In addition to simple splicing, where every intron between adjacent exons is removed, some proteins are also subject to alternative splicing. And this can give rise to a series of related but different proteins from the same mRNA. So at the top here, we have the DNA template showing four different coding regions interspersed with nonsense DNA. So the coding regions in um, blue, red, green, and yellow, and the nonsense DNA in white. 
when these are transcribed, you have the exons, the coding region, interspersed with the introns in the pre-mRNA molecule. Now these can be spliced in several different ways. So at the bottom here, if you remove every single intron and put all the adjacent exons together, you have this central protein that has four separate domains and represents the entirety of the coding sequence from that gene. However, if you splice the blue exon directly to the green exon, removing the red exon as part of the intron, and then splice it to the yellow exon, you have this protein here, which has three of the four domains that are possible. Alternatively, you can splice blue to red, and then red to yellow, removing the green exon along with the introns, and you have this third related molecule that has three domains, but th different domains to this molecule. So you can have many different related proteins with slightly different functional domains from the same RNA molecule, from the same gene. This is known as alternative splicing. So now I want to move on to the control of transcription and how genes are turned on and turned off. So we'll look at transcription factors and we'll look again at the promoter region and how the transcription factors interact with the promoter region. So transcription factors are specific DNA binding proteins which promote transcriptional activity of the basal transcriptional machinery. And they can alter the gene expression profile of a cell and there are four major classes of transcription factors that I want you to be aware of. The first class is the HTH or helix turn helix class and you can see this is self-explanatory. You have an alpha helix, a second alpha helix and these are linked by a turn in the polypeptide chain. These are capable of pincering on to the DNA molecule. Second class is the helix loop helix class, and again you have two alpha helices, but this time joined by a flexible polypeptide loop instead of a turn. There is the zinc finger class, in which a zinc molecule is coordinated by residues in the protein. And finally, there's the leucine zipper class of transcription factor, and in this case, within the alpha helix, there are multiple leucine residues that are capable of interacting with the DNA. All of these transcription factors bind in the major groove of the DNA. I now want to look at the larger promoter region. So here we have the upstream region of a eukaryotic gene. We have the core promoter here. So this is plus one down here where the coding region starts and the RNA will be transcribed from. Here we have the Tata box sitting at minus 25. Bound to the Tata box we have the Tata binding protein and transcription factors to D, A, B, F, E and H. So this is the basal transcriptional machinery that I mentioned when we looked at pro promoters previously. These are capable of recruiting and stabilizing the interaction of RNA polymerase with the DNA. So this is, in green and blue, the core transcriptional machinery that I showed earlier. However, there can be enhancer and silencer regions, the so control elements on in the promoter, located many kilobases upstream of this core promoter region. And these regions, many kilobases upstream, can still interact with this core promoter. And this slide indicates how. So if these control elements within the promoter activate the gene when there's a protein bound there, they're known as enhancers. And if they deactivate the gene, they're known as silencers. So these are the cis acting elements and the proteins that bind them are known as trans factors or transcription factors. So here we have some three activator proteins or activator transcription factors bound to enhancer elements upstream of the core promoter region. 
but because of the way in which DNA is capable of looping back on itself, these transcript transcription factors located far upstream are capable of interacting with the core transcriptional machinery. If a repressor protein, so a transcription factor that wants to downregulate the gene, were to bind a silencer element upstream of the core promoter, that too would be able to interact with core transcriptional machinery, but in a negative way. So if you have activators interacting with the core promoter, you have an activation of the gene occurs and you get greater levels of transcription. If you have a repressor interacting, it destabilizes the complex and you get lower levels of transcription, effectively turning off the gene. So these transcription factors bind to these control elements and have a cumulative effect on the activity of the gene. It may actually be the case that you have a mixture of activators and repressors bound to elements upstream of the core promoter. And it's the balance between activators and repressors that actually fine tune the activity of the gene. And looping of the DNA is required to allow these transcription factors to interact with the basal transcriptional machinery. And I want to move on from mRNA to the structure and function of rRNA and the ribosome. Ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, is the RNA component of the ribosome. This is a non-coding structural RNA and is essential for protein synthesis. The rRNA constitutes approximately 60% of the mass of the ribosome. The other 40% of the mass is protein. So ribosomes contain two major RNAs and one or two minor RNAs and they're arranged into a large subunit and a small subunit. Now there are slightly dif um, slight differences between ribosomes and prokaryotes and eukaryotes but they function in broadly the same way. This is the rRNA content of a eukaryotic cell. It's synthesized as a large precursor molecule that we call the 45S precursor molecule. The S in this case stands for Svedberg units, which is a measure of the sedimentation rate of each RNA and is roughly a readout for its mass, but it is also affected by its shape. This precursor molecule is degraded into three R RNAs. In eukaryotes, these are the 18S RNA, which is incorporated into the small subunit and the 5.8S RNA and the 28S RNA, which are incorporated into the large ribosomal subunit. In eukaryotes, there's also a 5S RNA, which is made elsewhere. In prokaryotes, the RNAs would be 23S, 16S, and 5S. In eukaryotes, there are many copies of the rRNA genes arranged in tandem repeats so in humans, there are approximately 300 to 500 repeats of these genes in five clusters. This reflects the fact that the cell has to produce huge numbers of ribosomes in order to make the protein it requires for its functions. And you can see on the right hand side of the slide here that the RNA structure of the RNA in a large subunit of the ribosome is quite intricate. There are many loops, folds and hairpins formed. This structure is absolutely critical to its function as a catalytically active piece of RNA. On this slide, I've shown the ribosome. As I mentioned on the previous slide, the ribosome is comprised of a large subunit and a small subunit. And these are also known by their Svedberg units or their sedimentation rates. So in bacteria, the large subunit is approximately 50 Svedberg units and the small subunit 30. In eukaryotes, this is 60 and 40, so slightly larger, more complex subunits. There are two or three rRNA molecules involved in the large subunit and one rRNA molecule involved in the small subunit. And you can see the structure of the ribosome shown here. So there are four major sites. We have the mRNA binding site, the A site, or the amino acyl site, the P site, or the peptidyl site, and the E site, or the exit site. This bottom illustration shows how the different ribonucleic acid molecules fit into the ribosome. 
So the mRNA molecule shown in red here passes through between the large and the small subunit. And the growing polypeptide chain is synthesized at the A and P sites and is displaced from the ribosome. We'll come back to more about the actual process of polypeptide chain formation later in this lecture. I now want to move on to the structure and function of tRNA. So we'll look at structure and function, how tRNA is processed and how it's coupled to an amino acid. So tRNA is an adapter molecule which acts as the physical link between the nucleotide sequence of the mRNA and the amino acid sequence of the polypeptide chain. tRNA has a clover leaf structure shown here with three stem loop motifs. The middle loop is known as the anticodon loop. At the end of the anticodon loop we have three nucleotides which are known as the anticodon and these are complementary to the codons found in mRNA. At the three prime end of the tRNA molecule is the amino acid attachment site where an amino acid can be enzymatically covalently linked to the tRNA. The identity of the amino acid attached to the tRNA at this site corresponds to the specificity of this anticodon. Uh, this means that there are different tRNA molecules for each possible amino acid coding codon. tRNAs are synthesized in precursor form and need some post-transcriptional modification before they can become functional. Firstly, a 16 nucleotide long leader sequence must be cleaved off from the 5' end of the molecule. Secondly, two uracil nucleotides at the 3' end of the molecule must be replaced with CAA, uh, sorry, with CCA, shown here. And finally, a 14 nucleotide long intron must be spliced out from the anticodon loop. There are also some chemical modifications made to some of the bases. So for example here, this guanosine becomes methylated, as does this um, aden adenine. Activation of a tRNA is a process by which the appropriate amino acid becomes covalently linked to the 3' end of the molecule. This reaction is catalyzed by aminoacyl tRNA synthetases. There is normally a single aminoacyl tRNA synthetase for each different amino acid. So here is a breakdown of the steps catalyzed by that enzyme. So we start off with an amino acid plus an ATP molecule. So this is an energy requiring step. And the amino acid is activated. So we have amino, amino acyl ATP, AMP. We also have the specific tRNA to which this amino acid should be covalently attached. And the specificity is determined by the identity of the anticodon loop. The activated amino acid is coupled to the 3' end of the tRNA molecule, catalyzed by the specific amino acyl tRNA synthetase. If this amino acid is lost from the tRNA, either accidentally or through the process of translation, this tRNA molecule can be recycled and recharged as necessary. So it can recycle back and pick up another activated amino acid. Okay, so having now covered mRNA, tRNA and rRNA, I want to look at more detail at the process of protein translation. So we'll look at codons, open reading frames, start and stop codons specifically, ribosome structure again, then the actual process of translation. So initiation, elongation and termination. We'll also have a quick look at polyribosomes. So codons are trinucleotide sequences on RNA, which are read in a 5' to 3' direction. They base pair with the anticodon found in the anticodon loop of tRNAs and are used to translate the four-letter code of nucleic acids into the 20 amino acid-based sequence of proteins. So it's possible to make 64 different codons with a four-letter code. 
However, there are only 20 amino acids used in protein synthesis, so there is a degree of redundancy in this code. Some amino acids are coded for by as many as six different codons, so examples of these would be serine or arginine, and other infrequently used amino acids are only coded for by a single codon, for example tryptophan. One codon, AUG, codes for methionine. This is known as the start codon and is located near the 5' end of an mRNA molecule. It signals the start position for the synthesis of a new polypeptide chain. This start codon is often surrounded by consensus sequences that favour initiation, and examples of these sequences would be the Shine Delgarno sequence or the COSAX sequence. These sequences assist the ribosome in binding to the mRNA molecule in a position close to the start codon. Three of the codons from the 64 possible codons don't actually code for amino acids but for STOP, the signal to terminate translation. And when the ribosome meets a STOP codon, it detaches and stops producing a polypeptide chain. It's possible to read the sequence of mRNA codons in three different frames. Each of these different frames is known as an open reading frame. Only one of these frames is normally the correct frame for the production of protein. So the position of the open reading frame is defined by the presence of a start codon as the first codon. And the end of an open reading frame is defined by the stop codon, which is found in the same frame. So here we have the same sequence of mRNA residues shown three times. In the first se series, I've split it into codons from the very first residue. And you can see if you can read this sequence this way, we have leucine, serine, valine, threonine. If we start one base in and split into codons, the same sequence can be read serine, alanine, leucine, proline. And if we start two residues into the same sequence, it can be read as glutamine, arginine, tyrosine, histidine. So it's important for the correct open reading frame to be defined and for the correct frame to be translated as it can significantly affect the protein sequence that's produced. Moving on to the ribosome, as I mentioned before, there are three major RNA binding sites in a ribosome. The A site is the position where an incoming amino acyl tRNA is bound. This is the tRNA which carries an amino acid which is yet to be joined to the growing polypeptide chain. The next position is the P site, and this is the position where the peptidyl tRNA is bound. This tRNA carries the growing polypeptide chain. The E site is the site where the, new re where the newly released tRNA exits the ribosome. There is also an mRNA binding site, which interacts with the Scheindelgarno sequence near the 5' end of the prokaryotic mRNA, or the COSAC sequence near the 5' end of the eukaryotic mRNA. This site allows the ribosome to identify the region of mRNA near the start codon for the appropriate initiation and translation of the mRNA into protein. While we haven't looked at the subcellular localization of ribosomes due to time constraints, it's worth noting that although all free ribosome components are found in the cytoplasm, once initiation has occurred, and a short length of peptide has been produced, some ribosome mRNA peptide complexes relocate to the endoplasmic reticulum. And proteins translated into the rough ER will be targeted to different subcellular and extracellular locations to those translated entirely in the cytoplasm. Initiation is the first step in the translation of an mRNA into protein. At the start of initiation, the ribosome subunits are not complexed with each other. The small subunit and associated initiation factors can scan the RNA molecule 
and locate the sequences near the start position to help orient the molecule onto the ribosome small subunit. The start codon is positioned in the P site with the help of an initiation factor 2. This requires a hydrolysis of GTP for energy. Upon hydrolysis of GTP, several of the small initiation factors dissociate and a large ribosomal subunit is now free to interact with a complex of small subunit mRNA and initiator amino acyl tRNA. So the initiator amino acyl tRNA always carries a methionine residue because the start codon in the P site always codes for methionine. Okay. Once a large subunit has bound to the small subunit and the mRNA, initiation is considered to be complete. The next step in the production of a polypeptide chain is elongation. Elongation is a cyclical process in which the growing polypeptide chain is added to in a regulated series of steps. In the first step, an incoming amino acyl tRNA enters the A site of the ribosome. This requires the action of elongation factors 1 and 2 and the hydrolysis of GTP for energy. In the second step, a peptide bond is formed between the carboxy group of amino acid in the P site and the amino group of the amino acid in the A site. So peptide bond formation here. This bond formation breaks the linkage between the amino acid and the tRNA in the P site and the growing polypeptide chain is transferred to the tRNA in the A site. The enzyme responsible for the formation of the peptide bond is peptidyl transferase. In the third step, shown at the bottom here, the peptidyl tRNA in the A site translocates into the P site. The mRNA also translocates along one codon, so the whole tRNA-mRNA complex shifts one site. The tRNA that was occupying the P site enters the E site and exits the ribosome. This tRNA re-enters the cytoplasmic tRNA pool and can be recharged with another activated amino acid. Now that the amino acid, as uh, now that the tRNA that was act occupying the A site has moved to the P site, the A site is free again and ready to receive the next amino acyl tRNA that's complementary to the codon now found in that site. As such, this process, the cycle, continues until the polypeptide chain is completed. During this process of elongation, it's very important to ensure that the tRNA entering the A site during the elongation phase is complementary to the codon on the, T on the mRNA molecule that occupies that site. To ensure this is the case, there is a proofreading mechanism that checks the identity of the amino acid before the peptide bond is made. So when the amino acyl tRNA enters the A site, there's a delay before the polypeptide bond is formed. Only a tRNA with the correct anticodon would be able to linger in the A site for long enough for there to be bond formation. So at each cycle of elongation, the entry of amino acyl tRNA to the A site is random and dependent upon the relative concentration of each tRNA available. In this way, the ribosomes allowing sampling of the available amino acyl tRNAs with a peptide, formed, with a peptide bond only being formed when a tRNA that's complementary to the pro to the codon is present. If a certain amino acyl tRNA is in short supply within the cell, this can lead to a bottleneck in translation, as the whole process has to wait for the correct tRNA to become available. This tends to occur with rare codon usage. Termination of peptide elongation occurs when a stop codon enters the A site. 
So you can see UGA here is a stop code on. When this translocates along one site, so we have here the tRNA with the growing polypeptide chain attached. Instead of a tRNA entering the A site, when the stop codon translocates into the A site, a release factor binds directly to the stop codon. This is GTP dependent, and this release factor alters the activity of the peptidyl transferase to add water to the carboxyl group of the polypeptide chain instead of another amino acid. This addition causes hydrolysis of the ester bond between the peptide chain and the tRNA in the P site and releases the newly synthesized protein from the ribosome. The whole ribosomal complex now dissociates. So you have the protein being released, the last tRNA released, the release factors released, and the dis dissociation of the large subunit, the small subunit, and the mRNA molecule. Finally, in this section, I want to discuss polyribosomes. A single mRNA molecule is not read by one ribosome at a time, which binds at the 5' end and just reads straight through to the 3' end. As soon as the first ribosome is clear of the 5' end of the molecule, another ribosome will bind and start translation. This results in a structure called a polyribosome. So you have, shown here, an mRNA molecule, shown in blue, from the 5' end to the 3' end, with ribosomes spaced all the way along its length. And you can see that the, if the ribosomes are close to the 5' end, the nascent polypeptide chain is short. And as the ribosomes move along and become close to the 3' end of the molecule, the nascent polypeptide chain is longer. Once they reach the stop codon, the polypeptide chains are released. These polyribosomes are, are structures that are, can be clearly resolved on electron microscopy. This means that multiple polypeptide chains can be formed from a single mRNA molecule at any one time. It's an extremely efficient way of creating a lot of protein from a single messenger strand. That's all I want to cover in this lecture. There are other RNA molecules produced within a cell, and I would like you to know about them, and these have been covered in the SDLA task. Thank you.